Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another Midweek Mystery, where today I'm going to be sharing some stories of some mysteriously missing flights from over the past century. Air travel is one of the safest ways to get from place to place, but as is the case with everything in life, nothing is 100% certain. If you're not a confident flyer, then perhaps this could be one for you to skip. If you don't care, then buckle in for this one. There's certain times that planes disappear and whilst you don't know exactly what happened, pieces will wash up and you can have some sort of semblance of closure through that. You'll have an idea of what might have happened in the air and at least know the fate of the people on board. But sometimes entire planes will just disappear completely, no trace of them ever found. So let's begin our first story in December 1944 with the disappearance of the plane of Glenn Miller and one of World War II's more enduring mysteries. Glenn Miller might not be a name that you'd know today but he was a big name in the world of big swing bands in the 1940s. He was an American trombonist, arranger, composer and band leader and he was a best-selling artist in the late 30s and early 40s. He was huge. But then, at the very peak of his career, he decided to give up everything to join the war effort. He was 38 years old at the time, so too old to be drafted and he was originally told that he wasn't needed by the military. So he wrote to the army to persuade them, saying that he could keep the troops entertained overseas and eventually they agreed. He was literally allowed into the army so he could join the army bands. Glenn was stationed in England where he and his band were originally headquartered at a BBC radio office in London before a close call with a bomb pushed him to relocate to Bedford. The very next day after he moved, a bomb did actually land on the offices and at least 70 people were killed. Over the coming months, Glenn begins on plans for a six week tour that his band had on the continent starting on December 16th. But Glenn decides that he needs to head over to Europe earlier to make some arrangements, just logistical tasks such as tickets and hotels and all that boring stuff. Usually he had someone, an administrative assistant, who did this for him, but he was in trouble for dereliction of duty, so it all came down to Glenn to sort all of this out himself. He was originally meant to be headed to Paris on the 14th, and he had a seat reserved on another plane, but when he reached the terminal that morning, he found out that flight had been cancelled due to bad weather. Flights weren't supposed to resume at all, he was told, until the 17th. That clearly didn't work for him, the tour was due to start the 16th and he had a lot of organising to do over in Paris. Another man called Lieutenant Colonel Norman F. Basil was also trying to get to Paris as he had a very important staff meeting on the 16th. He'd actually only come over to England for Paris a few days beforehand and was supposed to be headed straight back there but the weather put a spanner in his plans. Through word of mouth, Norman soon hears about Glenn's fight to get to Paris as well. Norman had been keeping a very close eye on the weather and he noticed a very small window of improvement the next day. And he tells Glenn that he'd be happy to give him a ride to Paris in his plane if the weather permitted. So Glenn Miller and Norman Basel boarded a UV-64A Norseman plane to make the journey. That means nothing to me, it might mean something to you, it was just a small one engine plane. Alongside the pilot, John Morgan, who was apparently very young and eager to please. A more experienced pilot that day might have rejected the journey. Despite the incredibly foggy weather that day in both England and France on December 15th, 1944, the plane took off from Twinwood Airfield in Bedfordshire at 1.53pm. The flight was due to arrive in Paris at any point between 3.45 and 3.51pm, but it never did. It was soon established that Royal Air Force spotters had seen the plane heading out over the channel at 2.37pm, so at this point the plane was on course and on time, but that was the last time it was seen. The general consensus is that the plane went down at some point over the channel, but why did it happen and why has no trace of the plane ever been found? 
a bit of context for my non-UK or non-French viewers about the channel, or sometimes called the English Channel, this is part of the Atlantic Ocean that separates southern England from northern France. It's about 350 miles long, but at its narrowest point it only separates France and England by 21 miles. On a good day you can look across the cliffs of Dover and see France on the horizon, and people will quite regularly swim the width of it but that is at its narrowest point, the widest point is 150 miles, which would be a bit more of a challenge to swim. The route the pilot John Morgan would have taken that day would have been along the SHAEF corridor, probably, standing for Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. This was the main protected route for transport planes flying from England to France during the war. So Morgan probably would have headed along this route but he wasn't to know until they were in the air just how prohibitive the weather was going to be and it turns out the plane had no authorization to be in the air in the first place. Pilot Morgan had to fly in from another location to pick up Norman and Glenn in Twinwood, which he did have clearance to do, but once he got there, that's where the clearance ended. He was supposed to wait for authorization to head over the channel but he knew that requests for clearance would be denied due to the weather, so it seems that Morgan just decided to go for it. Whether the two passengers knew all this, we're not too sure. So this is already a very dodgy flight, but on top of all of this, nobody knew that Major Glenn Miller was aboard this flight. He was only there on invite from Norman, and when the flight didn't arrive in France, no one knew that he was missing. I mean, no one in an official capacity even knew that this plane was supposed to be arriving in Paris. It wasn't until the 18th of December when the rest of his band arrived at Orly Airport did anyone realise that something was amiss. Miller wasn't there to meet them as planned and so they start making inquiries. And it was only then that the alarm sounded and superiors were told that Glenn Miller was missing. They begin an official investigation and soon found out that Glenn had left with Norman Basel in a small plane bound for Paris. Immediately, of course, the worst was suspected, that the plane had gone down in the channel. Only no trace of the missing plane or of a life raft was found in the six-day investigation that followed. An official announcement that he was missing wasn't made until Christmas Eve, making the papers on Christmas Day. The loss of Glenn Miller at this time was said to be akin to the loss of Michael Jackson, John Lennon, Elvis. He was a huge name back in the day and it was felt right across America. But what do we think happened? For a really long time it was just assumed that the plane had gone down due to bad weather and that makes the most sense here, right? But there's theories of Glenn being a spy or the plane being shot down by friendly fire. Let's begin by delving into the weather theory, which is something we can all probably agree is quite likely. As I said, the fog was very thick that day and it was reportedly one of the worst UK winters on record. This could have been a classic weather-related incident driven by some very human factors. The pilot didn't have current weather information and he left without clearance. It was a recipe for disaster. It's thought that Morgan may have been bullied into accepting this flight by his boss, Norman Basel, who by all accounts is a very demanding man, not the sort of person that you said no to. In their flight over the channel, they may have encountered freezing temperatures and the plane engine might have become crippled by ice, or it's possible that the pilot simply became spatially disorientated and poor visibility. He may have lost all knowledge of the altitude and bearing of the plane and as a result became completely confused. And this isn't just a bit of disorientation, this is a genuine thing that can happen to pilots. They just lose it. It's likely that over the channel in this thick, thick fog, Morgan's brain told him that things were different than what they were or it processed incorrect information. He may have just crashed directly into the channel, thinking that they were a lot higher than they were. 
Water landings and aircrafts with fixed landing gear usually mean that the plane will flip over. And then expected survival time in water of this temperature would only be one hour. And that's if they even got out of the plane in the first place. If they crashed into the water at high speed in the plane, then they probably would have died on impact. The 8th Air Force would eventually establish that without evidence to the contrary, the plane went down over the water due to the probability of engine slash carburetor ice and all the possibilities of wing ice and pilot spatial disorientation. That was the official story, the official explanation. But then there's the friendly fire theory. In 1984, so 40 years later, a former RAF navigator recalled how in mid-December 1944, he saw a small aircraft knocked out of the air when a 4,000 pound bomb was jettisoned into the channel from the Allied plane that he was in, returning from an aborted mission over Germany. The navigator was sure that the Norseman plane was an accidental victim of this bomb being dropped, and a British aviation historian who looked into this did find it to be credible. Media coverage of this soon made this the accepted version of events in this story. However, further investigation by more people has found that the timings simply don't match up here for this to be the case. It was originally thought that the timings did match up, according to RAF logs, but it was later realised that for some reason the RAF was still using British summertime timings in their logs at this point, even though it was now December. Therefore, the timings are out by an hour, they don't match up here. Also, some people question the navigator's story here, as it's very unlikely that he would have been able to see a light plane a mile below him through the thick clouds and fog of that day. And he didn't report seeing this at the time either, which throws the whole story into question. All in all, a lot of people don't really tend to believe this theory nowadays, but there is an element of plausibility. And then there's the more far-fetched theories of the Germans shooting down the plane or that Glenn was actually a spy for the Allies and was therefore assassinated. However, these are just theories, there's no actual proof of either of these things being the case. Another theory is even stranger, that he actually survived this flight and ended up dying of a heart attack in a Paris brothel. This rumour first appeared in a German tabloid in 1997 saying that the journalist had discovered this information whilst reading documents obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. However, why this death would need to be covered up in such a way, and what this means as to the fate of Norman Basel and John Morgan, who of course have also never been seen again, I don't really know, I don't know how this matches up. I do tend to think myself that this one is just a case of Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is usually the right one. At one point fairly recently, they did think they might have had a clue as to what happened here. A fisherman has claimed that he snagged a plane in his nets in 1987, in an area located about 30 miles off of Portland Bill. The fisherman said that he caught this plane and simply let it drop back to the seabed, not thinking too much of it. However, years later, he said he saw pictures of the missing plane in this story and realised that it was the same type of plane. He contacted people with his story and word eventually got to the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, who had to make a decision as to whether they should search this area for the plane. This area where the fisherman said he found the plane doesn't quite match with the route that they should have taken that day, it's way too far west, but then again if the pilot was disorientated they could have been anywhere. The last update I can find on this is the group are fundraising to launch an investigation. They want to search for this plane and find out if it was indeed the right one. So there is very much still hope. This one might not be a mystery forever. But then again, a lot of planes went down over the English Channel during the war. For our second aviation mystery, we have the story of the Flying Tiger Flight 739, which prompted one of the largest air and sea searches in the history of the Pacific. 
This was a plane chartered by the United States military that disappeared in March 1962 during the preliminary stages of the Vietnam War. This happened at the point when the USA was still denying any interference in Vietnam, whilst actually had its fingers all over it. The United States military signed a contract with a civilian cargo airline called Flying Tiger Line, so instead of flying over their troops on military planes, which would make it very obvious to everyone that they were more involved in Vietnam than they said, they could fly troops over on these chartered planes staffed by civilians. Civilians looking in from the outside would have had no idea that the USA were actually placing troops on the ground in Vietnam. Most of these planes would leave from the Travis Air Force Base in Fairfield, California, and the focus of this story, the 739, is no exception. The plane departed from the base at 5.45am GMT on the 14th of March 1962, destined for Saigon with four refuelling stops planned along the journey. These were in Honolulu, Wake Island, which is a tiny island in the Pacific, Guam and Clark Air Base in the Philippines. There were 96 passengers on board and 11 crew members. 93 of the passengers were army rangers and 3 were South Vietnamese soldiers, the identity of whom are still not known to even this day. These weren't a group of rangers from one specific unit in the USA, these were a random bunch of people from all over the country, which has led to many people speculating over the years this group may have been specifically picked for a special mission overseas. All the rangers aboard were said to be highly trained electronics and communication specialists, and according to an article on sfgate.com, one man's mother believed that he was going to Vietnam to make a special training film, and others think that the men might have been going over to assist with wiretapping and espionage. It seems the men were aware of the dangers before they set off though, with a number of these men making arrangements just in case something happened to them. They asked that their wives and children be taken care of. Some of these men outright said that they didn't think they would ever be coming back, one saying, I think I signed my death warrant. But it seems that they thought that whatever awaited them in Vietnam was deadly. I don't think they expected the flight to be. According to one source, the men were under orders to relieve soldiers in Saigon tasked with training Vietnamese troops to fight the Viet Cong guerrillas. Why they would be under the impression they wouldn't come back alive from this if this was the case and what they were told, I don't really know. The flight set off from California with no issues and arrived in Guam as planned, but it was slightly delayed by this point due to minor engine maintenance at both Honolulu and Wake Island. At Wake Island as well, four of the flight attendants got off to be replaced by four new crew members and their lives would be spared. The plane departed from Guam at 12.57 GMT and was estimated to arrive in the Philippines about six and a half hours later. Upon leaving, the plane had enough fuel for a nine and a half hour flight. It wasn't going to run out. About 80 minutes after the plane departed at 2.22 PM GMT, the pilot radioed a routine message, giving his position as being 280 miles west of Guam. He didn't mention any problems. In fact, throughout this portion of the flight, the pilot made a lot of transmissions all pertinent to the flight, with no problems whatsoever, everything was as it should have been. The pilot was due to make another scheduled position report at 3.30pm, but it seems at that time the Guam IFSS were experiencing temporary communication difficulties with heavy radio static. So it wasn't until 3.39pm that the radio operator actually tried to contact the plane for a position report, but they were unable to establish contact. Each attempt at contact they made was met with complete silence. And from there, the plane was not seen or heard from ever again. It had vanished. The plane never arrived in the Philippines as planned, and 10 hours after takeoff, when the plane would have certainly run out of fuel, it was assumed that they had crashed. 
A distress status was initiated and the Air Force quickly sent out planes to search the flight route. The plane was officially declared as missing on the 16th of March 1962 and a huge search was conducted, making the most of manpower from the Air Force, US Navy, Coast Guard and Marines and the search covered more than 200,000 square miles. Not a single trace of the flight has ever been found nor had there been any solid clues, it literally just vanished. I mean, we can assume that the plane is probably sitting at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, not literally vanished, but why? What happened? At the time of the disappearance, the weather was said to be clear and the sea was calm. It's not like there was a freak storm that brought it down. Four days into the search, the Air Force Major General was forced to make a statement to the press, saying, that although the chances of finding survivors were doubtful, every effort was going to be made as long as there was hope. But eventually he was forced to say the chances of finding survivors are now about one in infinity. After eight days of nothing, the search was called off. Almost 60 years later and there still hasn't been a single trace of the flight, not even a single piece of metal found floating in the ocean. The only potential clue we have to go on comes from a Liberian tanker, the SS TL Linzen, where witnesses aboard noticed vapour trails moving west and disappearing into a layer of clouds. A few seconds later, they saw a large explosion, followed by two fireballs falling from the sky at different speeds. This happened about 17 miles from the ship's current position, according to its radar, and this location would have been on the approximate flight path of the 739. So it was this area that search and rescue really focused on. And whilst this does sound like a huge clue, it wasn't as huge as you'd think. I mean, even without the, I mean, even without the tanker seeing this, investigators would have assumed that something like this had happened, that the plane had just fallen out of the sky. The big question was, what had caused it? Because almost all aircraft experts believe that a plane such as this one isn't just going to explode mid-air. That's not something that really happens in real life. It's not impossible, of course, but completely improbable. Fuel tanks don't just blow up like that. Which, of course, leads to theories of sabotage. Had somebody messed with the plane? It has been noted that the plane was left unattended on tarmac in a poorly lit area for a short period of time on the stopover in Guam. It could be possible that somebody tinkered with something in that time, but even then you'd have to have an intricate understanding of plane mechanics to do something like this, and the plane wasn't left alone for long enough for somebody to really mess with it and there was nothing on board that would have been powerful enough to cause an explosion of this size, which means that if the plane did explode, then there had to be an external reason for it. People have speculated that it could have been a meteor, or even perhaps a missile. A lot of modern day historians speculate that the plane may have accidentally been shot down, or maybe not so accidentally. With the USA involved in the beginnings of the Vietnam War and the Cold War at this time, there were plenty of potential enemies to point the finger at, and most suspected the Soviet Union. But of course, this is just speculation because there's no clear motive behind doing such a thing. If the Soviet Union shot the plane out of the air, surely there'd be a reason for it, and they never said there would have been. Things didn't really happen in wartime for no reason, and this was the Cold War. The whole thing was that neither the USA nor the Soviet Union really did anything to each other. It was cold. So why would the Soviet Union randomly shoot a plane out of the air and never say they did it or why they did it? Like, it just doesn't really make much sense. Some theorise that this was a kidnapping or a plane hijacking, but realistically it's unlikely that a single or even a couple of hijackers would have been able to overpower an entire plane full of highly trained military men. Plus, what would be the end game of such a hijacking? To make demands? Those never came, or at least they never did in public knowledge. 
maybe the end game was simply to kill everyone aboard, which brings us back round to why were these men headed to Vietnam in the first place. A lot of the surviving families suspect this was a secret military operation gone wrong, thanks to all the weird circumstances leading up to it. So many of these men acted like they were never ever going to come home, they were really cagey about their reasons for going to Vietnam, and reports say that some of them left behind very important items such as their IDs and their wedding bands. Some suspect that the plane never exploded at all and that it did actually land at its destination, but the military have covered up exactly what happened in Vietnam. They think they did land, do whatever they needed to do, all ended up dying, and the military have just covered it up. Some family members have even gone as far as submitting their DNA to military databases to identify bodies found abroad, but the government has denied all those requests for legal reasons. Requests to have their loved ones' names added to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington DC have also been repeatedly denied by the government because they weren't there on a mission apparently. But of course they'd say that. I'm not often one to believe in cover-ups, but this one reeks of something to me. Why were these men going over there? Were they supposed to die in Vietnam? Why did the plane blow up? Was it just a pure coincidence? Over the years, there have been many record requests made to the Army, Air Force, Defence Department, National Archives, State Department and CIA, but nothing has revealed anything new. The Travis Air Force Base doesn't even have any documentation about this flight in their archives, which is weird. And to add another layer to this mystery, on the same day that the 739 disappeared over the Pacific, Another flying tiger plane, the 7819, carrying secret military cargo, also crashed during an attempted approach to Adak Island in Alaska. There were only seven people aboard this flight and it wasn't as deadly. Six of the crew members walked away with minor injuries and only one died after becoming trapped in the fire. The fact that this happened on the very same day raised a lot of red flags, but investigation found that this one was caused by pilot error. Apparently they were advised multiple times to execute a specific type of approach to the runway, but the pilot ignored the advice and tried something else. They ended up landing 300 feet short of the runway, hitting rocks. The timing is questionable and some still think it's suspicious, but Maybe not. There's no evidence of anything in this case. Maybe there really was just a mechanical malfunction and the 739 went down. Maybe it was something completely innocent. In April 1963, the Civil Aeronautics Board investigation concluded, a summation of all relevant factors tends to indicate the aircraft was destroyed in flight. However, due to the lack of any substantiating evidence, the board is unable to state with any degree of certainty the exact fate. There's no conclusive proof of anything in this case, but I feel that somebody knows. Why were those men even on the flight in the first place? After repeatedly being rebuffed about their loved ones being included on the Vietnam War Memorial, just earlier this year, in May 2021, a memorial was revealed in Columbia Falls, Maine, honouring the lives of the lost on this flight. Nobody knows what happened, but this memorial is a small piece of closure for the families. Finally, we're going to be taking a look at the disappearance of the Flight 19 torpedo bombers a group of five small planes that all disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle on 5th of December 1945. What was supposed to be a routine training flight turned into an enduring mystery, with 27 people missing, presumed dead. It's said to be this incident that began the legend of the Bermuda Triangle, a region of the North Atlantic Ocean where a number of aircraft and ships are said to have disappeared under mysterious circumstances, hundreds of them over the years. This all happened four months after the end of World War II, and it was just supposed to be a standard training exercise. 
Flight 19, the group of five planes, left from the Naval Air Station in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, shortly after 2pm on December 5th, for practice bombing runs on a sunken ship. Between the five planes there were 14 crew members, a pilot on each as well as two crew members. Although the fifth plane only had one crew member as one airman who was supposed to join had apparently asked to be excused from this particular exercise and that decision would have saved his life. The leader of the flight was Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, a seasoned naval aviator with 2,500 flying hours under his belt as well as multiple World War II combat tours in the Pacific. The exercise they were on that day was called Navigation Problem Number 1. They were to fly east from the Florida coast, conduct bombing runs at Hens and Chicken Shoals on a sunken ship, turn north and then proceed over the Grand Bahama Island before flying back to Fort Lauderdale. The weather was projected to be okay that day, a few showers here and there, but nothing that these experienced pilots couldn't handle. The first leg of the flight went as planned, but it was on the second leg, after they dropped their bombs, that things seemed to go wrong. Taylor started to become convinced that his plane's compass was malfunctioning, and that they were all flying in the wrong direction. The reasons why he thought it was malfunctioning are still unclear to this day, but he decided that his compasses, I think there were two on board, could no longer be trusted. And by this point, the weather had begun to deteriorate a little. There was a front bringing in rain and heavy cloud cover, which would have only added to his confusion. Over the radio, it was heard that one pilot said, I don't know where we are, we must have got lost after that last turn. There was another Navy pilot called Lieutenant Robert F. Cox, who was separate from Flight 19, flying near the Florida coast, who overheard these radio communications, and he informed the air station of the situation with Flight 19. He contacted the group, asking if they needed assistance, to which Taylor responded, Both my compasses are out, and I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm over land, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm in the Keys, but I don't know how far down. For reference, the Florida Keys are about 100 miles south of Fort Lauderdale, but hundreds of miles off course of where they should have been. People have since speculated that he may well have confused some islands of the Bahamas for the Keys. Under normal circumstances, if they get lost in the Atlantic, pilots are supposed to point towards the setting sun and fly west towards land. But if Taylor became convinced that he was over the Florida Keys, he might have made the decision to fly northeast. If he was really in the Bahamas, then this would only have taken him and the rest of the planes further out to sea. Also, as Lieutenant Cox flew further south, the transmission between the two aircrafts got weaker rather than stronger. If Taylor was in the Keys where he said he was, the signal would have got stronger. It's said that one of the other pilots on the flight realised the mistake, noting over the radio, if we would just fly west, we would get home, goddammit. There's been a lot of question over the years as to why the other pilots didn't just break formation and head back in the right direction, especially once it became clear that they were going to run out of fuel or conditions got treacherous. But the only explanation that people can offer is that these were military men taught to follow commanders under all conditions. Military discipline is a really strong thing and they likely would have been conditioned to just follow Taylor, the leader of the flight, their commander. It's thought that the more lost the flight got, the more stressed they got and the mental conditions started to diminish. In the transmissions, Taylor starts calling himself MT-28 instead of FT-28, which is a rookie error for such an experienced pilot. According to the Express, he'd even asked to be relieved of command early that day, a request that it seems was denied. Did Taylor know that he wasn't in the right mental state to be leading that day? Despite requests to hand over command to another pilot on the flight, and to change the frequency he was broadcasting on, he denied both. Communication remained pretty open throughout the next couple of hours when they first realised they were lost, but as time went on, things got more desperate. 
the weather was getting worse, the sun was setting and the planes were due to run out of fuel at any time. Depending on which source you want to believe, the last communication from Taylor was received at either 6.20 or 7.04pm. He said, All planes close up tight, we'll have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll all go down together. There is some proof to suggest that one plane did break formation and tried to head back safely, but nothing was mentioned of this in the last message, so it is thought they all did go down together. When it became obvious that the flight was hopelessly lost, all of the relevant people were alerted. All air bases, aircrafts and merchant ships in the area were told to keep an eye out. The Navy scrambled search planes to hunt for the group and at 7.27pm a pair of PBM Mariner flying boats took off just north of Fort Lauderdale. Just 20 minutes later one of this pair suddenly vanished off the radar themselves. This plane had a crew of 13 people and they'd originally been scheduled for their own training flight before the search took precedence. The rescue plane radioed the tower that they were nearing Flight 19's last assumed position, and then nothing. Just like Flight 19, this plane was never heard from again, and all 13 crew members are missing, presumed dead. A nearby ship, the SS Gaines Mills, reported seeing an explosion at sea off of New Smyrna Beach at 7.50pm, as well as what they reported to be a falling airplane. The ship was also part of the search for survivors of Flight 19, and they noted a widespread oil slick in the area where they saw this plane drop out of the sky. No trace of this plane has ever been found, but it's commonly presumed that it was just an explosion shortly after takeoff, a pure coincidence. Flying boats of this type are not the safest of planes, and they have a real reputation for randomly catching fire. They're nicknamed flying gas tanks for a reason. Had Flight 19 not gone missing, there's a chance this plane may have exploded anyway during the planned training exercise but there's no way of knowing for sure. At sunrise the next morning, the Navy dispatched a huge number of boats and planes to search for both Flight 19 and the missing Mariner. There were 248 planes in the air alone and more boats than you can count and I am pleased to report that all of these did make it back to land safely. More than 200,000 square miles of the Atlantic Ocean and Gulf of Mexico were searched but it was complicated by the fact that they simply didn't know where Flight 19 had gone down. They even searched land as well, just in case. They searched for as long as fuel reserves and daylight would let them, looking for any trace of a wreckage to no avail. If Flight 19 did go into the ocean, then perhaps some peace can be bought by the fact that they wouldn't have survived impact. As brutal as that sounds, that's maybe better than drowning. Hitting the surface of the ocean at speed is similar to hitting a brick wall in a And this is where the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle comes into play. It's long been suspected that the reason so many people get lost in this area is because it messes with magnetic fields. It's an area of strong electromagnetic disturbances and compasses work on magnetic fields. I wonder if any of the compasses in the other planes were also playing up. Some think there's something a lot darker going on in the Bermuda Triangle with monsters and aliens and talk of the paranormal. These theories have all been debunked but people believe it and maybe that is the case. I don't personally think that it is. In 1986 the wreckage of the same type of plane was found off of the Florida coast which was originally believed to be one of the missing Flight 19 planes although testing couldn't find any definitive evidence. Then in 1991, a salvaging ship found the wrecks of five planes 600 foot below the ocean bottom, just off of the Florida coast also, but tail numbers quickly revealed that they were not Flight 19. They were simply other planes that had gone missing two years before Flight 19, and luckily in that case, all the crew survived, thankfully. 
There's been multiple reports of the flight being found over the years, but nothing's ever been proven. It seems there's just a lot of planes going down in the ocean around Florida. People question why Taylor tried to get out of the flight just before it was due to take off. They ask if he knew something the rest didn't. But most think that he just knew that he wasn't fit for duty that day. Maybe he knew his mental capacity wasn't quite what it should have been. There's also a question as to why the rest of the flight didn't make use of the rescue radio frequency, which could have helped them towards land. The pilots were explicitly told to switch the devices on, but they didn't. Why? That one's completely unexplained. Again, I do think this one's a case of Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is usually the right one, but there are still so many unanswered questions. But there you go. Three stories of missing flights. Something a little bit different, but I've been wanting to share these stories for a while and I figured this was the best way to do it, otherwise my channel would get overrun with aviation related mysteries. Do let me know if you found this interesting and or you want to see anything similar in the future. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.